And we're back. Uh, I am Robert Evans, and this is, again, Behind the Bastards, the show where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. And this is, of course, part two of our epic two-part series on Steven Seagal, a man who is so much worse than you would guess. Yeah, he really sucks. You probably just thought he was a movie star who got rich and retired, and, and that was the end of this story. But as we have learned, not only did his career start thanks to the mafia, he is a alleged serial sexual assaulter. And today, we're about to get into his time as a lawman, his hobby as a best friend to dictators, uh, and the human trafficking allegations oh, against him. thank God. <laughs> yeah. Steven Seagal. Uh, I'd like to open up this episode with another excerpt from uh, the bio on Steven Seagal's personal website. Sean. John Riley, I did not introduce you in this I, episode. Which they listened to you part should. one. You, if you didn't listen to part one, you're terrible. Yeah, you blew it. You're uh, the bastard. Yeah, I'm Sean, baby. I write jokes on the internet. Yeah, and nice. we're drinking, and I'm going to open another beer right now. Now we're talking. Now we're talking, and now we're drinking. Uh, and now we're Steven Seagalling. I'm ready. Now, first, actually, I want to I want to get through an important issue with you. If some sort of teleportation accident were to create multiple Steven Seagal. Uh-huh. They would be Steven's Seagal, right? It's like a like a like an attorney's yeah. general sort of situation. You know, I, I think I would probably say Steven Seagal's like just as an impulse, but when you say Steven Seagal, I like that a lot more and I would absolutely yeah. train myself into saying it. Steven that way. Seagal. Absolutely. All right. If that ever happens, listeners, uh back us up on this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If there is like a Steven's Seagal and infestation. It's, it's likely to happen. It probably already has happened if you listen to one of the Steven's Seagal who is uh, uh inhabiting our world here. In fact, it looks like several Steven's Seagal have merged into one giant Steven Seagal. <laughs> like if you've seen him in the last ten years or so. He looks like three Steven Seagals wearing a trench coat trying to be one Steven Seagal. Yeah. Because it's, it, it's not like he's putting on weight like, like he's getting there, obese. He's, it's like he's growing in every direction. There's there's nothing shameful about being a 68-year-old man and putting on some weight. Of sure, course. Everyone. Sure. Everyone. I'm saying he's he, wearing it. He, he, he's wearing it as if it's degrees. other people it's, attached to his body. He's like <laughs> ate the fucking Willy Wonka gum or something. He's just growing. But he's also, his hair's getting more Dracula every day. He... He's Actually, like that's how you would cast him today. Blood-feeding tick. He could be a good Dracula. Yeah. He could be a really believable, heavy-set Dracula. Exactly. He would travel by, like, turning sideways and rolling <laughs> after you. <laughs> the more CGI they can throw in there, the better, really. So I'd like to open the... Uh... <laughs> he turns sideways. <laughs> He's, like, picking up shit like Katamari. I bet he wears all black now because it covers the sweat <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we know what's going on. So I'd like to open this episode with another excerpt from the bio on Steven Seagal's personal website. At the core of what drives Steven Seagal with all he does, his music, his martial arts, and his acting, is his commitment to Asian philosophies and religion. And Asian is capitalized. Aww. (laughs) Yeah, that's... That's that's something else. As a Buddhist, Zen teacher, and healer, Stephen lives by the principles that the development of the physical self is essential to protect the spiritual man. He believes that what he does in his life is about leading people into contemplation to wake them up and enlighten them in some manner. <laughs> Fuck, if, if you can find one goddamn person that exists in the world who's like, I never thought of myself as a deep philosopher <laughs> until I met Stephen Seagal. Oh, boy. <laughs> I am excited for this next part. I didn't even tease this. He's he's a Buddhist lama. Yeah. He's an, no officially. Oh, of course. Not not just is he a Buddhist lama. He is the reincarnation of a 17th century Buddhist mystic officially. Oh, I knew. Oh, you knew. Okay, well, you would have guessed it that. in his aura. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you've 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 got that kind of vision. Then you have the same kind of vision as a uh, Buddhist leader Pinor Rinpoche, uh, who is the actual Tibetan Buddhist leader who oh. declared Steven Seagal a reincarnation of a 17th century Buddhist mystic. <laughs> uh, here's Panor. <laughs> Steven Seagal has been recognized as a reincarnation of the 17th century hidden treasure revealer Shundrag Dorhi of Palyu Monastery. Shundrag Dorhi founded a small monastery called Gigon Gompa near his native village in Fene in the Kutsi area of Derj on eastern Tibet. Though there are no monks there now, the small monastery building still exists and is well known in the area for its beautiful religious wall paintings. So that's nice. Wow. They're not known for their, their public school system. This dude 
Sounds like he's kind of a dipshit. <laughs> well, he made Steven Seagal the yeah, reincarnation. That's what of I'm a... saying. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah, yeah. I mean, I may not be it. reading it well. Um, but yeah, uh, as you might guess, other Hollywood Buddhists who have not been accused of numerous sexual assaults took issue with the announcement that Steven Seagal was officially a Buddhist Lama. He's literally like a step below the Dalai Lama. Like, holy shit. That's, that's real. That's as far as official. Yeah, it's official. Uh, Richard Gere and Tina Turner, both devout Tibetan Buddhists, should in theory venerate Steven Seagal for being just a step down from the Dalai Lama himself. But instead, they accused him of having bribed Panor Rinpoche and other Buddhist lamas into granting him the title. Uh, Gandon Thurman, director of special projects for the Tibet House in New York, noted that, quote, I'm afraid it troubles me. I always wondered at the action heroes he played. He always seems to be the only one who tortures his enemies. <laughs> Which is... He really is. Just he a really dick. Is. I was saying this in the yeah. last episode. He just tears apart all of his enemies. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's some good questions as to why this guy would be a reincarnation of an yeah. enlightened Buddhist mystic. Pinor Rinpoche denies being bribed by Seagal. Uh, he states that neither I nor any of my monasteries have received or sought any sort of substantial donation from him. I think Thanks. substantial's the key word there's there. The I, I, uh-huh. It seems like some bribery happened. But, so, so doesn't this guy like talk to God and stuff? Like, Wouldn't God be like, hey, don't make that guy the... I don't know how like religion I don't know works. how Buddhism works. Right. I but... don't think they talk to God. Um because that's like a Buddhist thing, right? Well, no, because there's different types of Buddhism because there are some Buddhism some Buddhist sects that like venerate Buddha as sort of a deity. Okay. Um but I think in general. But there's no questions the you get. It's like say you're a, like a dumbass and you're like in charge of somehow naming who is the reincarnated. Yeah. Dalai because Lama. Steven Seagal gave you seventy thousand dollars. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I, is there like no like checks and balances in that? Like religion for someone to say, like, "Hey, guys, I think I found the reincarnation. I think it's this sexual assaulter who lies about everything." <laughs> and there's no one to say, like, "You know, I don't, I don't think you're right. I don't think he's the reincarnation uh, of that 17th century monk. I don't buy it. <laughs> I like th- he, that tree might be the guy. I mean, let me let me pause. Like, how do you it. check? Can you do you have like a spectrometer you can like attach to? Because I know Scientologists have like little the devices. E-meter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so they can like measure. How many times you're being reincarnated? Well, they, there was like this ceremony where he had to recognize some possessions that had been owned by himself. But that's the oh. kind of thing you can set up. Um, no, you can't fake that shit. You can't fake that that's shit. Real. I don't know. <laughs> my 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 personal feeling here is that um, maybe Chung Drang Dori, the 17th century Buddhist uh, monk who Steven Seagal is the reincarnated form of, maybe Chung Drang was a serial sexual assaulter. <laughs> this is make, all uh, that would make part sense. of the course. <laughs> Entirely possible. If he is, that would be like I'd support this claim that Steven Seagal is reincarnated. Yeah. If if the Dalai Lama comes out and says no, he was a monster. Yeah. And this man is the reincarnation, and he must be stopped. Dude, now we're talking. This now is a movie we're talking. That's a Steven Seagal movie I would watch in the modern age. Under Buddha, I think uh, six out of ten so far. I think we can top it, but it's a good title. Okay, it's a good title. We'll we'll see what else we can. Yeah, the definition of substantial can vary a lot. So I. I wouldn't be surprised if Steven Seagal bribes some Buddhists. Um, now, despite being ordained as a holy man in 1997, uh, the late 1990s proved to be the winding down period for Seagal's career, as we previously stated. Uh, Under Siege was his most successful film. In 1994, he filmed On Deadly Ground, uh, an action movie with an environmental message about oil companies and Alaska, featuring offensively inaccurate depictions of Native American women doing actual spiritual dances but doing them naked, which is not how the dances were performed. <laughs> Steven Seagal, everybody. That was Steven Seagal's note, I bet. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like 100%. Like the spiritual dances, but like, I think it would be more enlightening if they took the titties out. Make sure they're real and very serious religi- religious <laughs> rituals, but make them do it naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's perfect. That's, that encapsulates my interests very well. <laughs> Both cultural appropriation <laughs> and gratuitous and nudity. Ladies. I'm uh, Steven Seagal. I'm Steven Seagal. I approve this film. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> oh, boy. Steven. Steven, Steven, Steven. So, um, in 1995, uh, Seagal filmed a sequel to Under Siege. Uh, in 1986, he was in Kurt Russell's executive decision for about a hot minute and then oh. very quickly got sucked out of I a love, plane, right? I love this story. Yeah. It, 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 there's a, a rumor that he was in the movie theater when this happened, and he gets sucked out of the plane, like, basically the moment it's about, oh, it's Steven Seagal time, and he just fucking dies. Like, <laughs> like, and the crowd cheered. Like, the crowd thought this was really funny, and they loved that Steven Seagal died before he got to do anything. And Steven Seagal, in a fit, like, got up and, like, stormed out of the theater, and his manager was like, no, dude, 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 
they're cheering because they love you. They're cheering because, and they hit, he had to talk him down like you would a toddler. And no. Say like, yeah, he's like, no, no, no. They're not cheering because you're dead. They're cheering because they, they, you're the best and they, the, you died a hero. And like, and then they, they calmed him down and got him to go back. I have no idea how accurate this was, but oh, this is man. The, the rumor that I heard. That's canon for this show, for sure. Yeah. yeah we're, we're, we're That's calling that canon right now. Absolutely, like, as true as any fucking thing Steven Seagal has ever said. Probably truer, other than the thing about the Chagall exhibit, because that I can't imagine someone lying about that. That's probably real. Yeah, yeah. That, and that. he's probably that 17th century, like, rapist. <laughs> Drunk Drunk Dory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Famed 17th century rapist, Chung Drunk Dory. Boy, uh, that particular. I hope that doesn't make it onto that poor dude's Wikipedia. No, because he's been dead for centuries. Yeah, he, doesn't he need wouldn't this. be able to answer. He doesn't need it. this. This no. is how it is. One accusation ruins your life. Even after you're dead, that's I'm, I do a bad Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, I thought you were doing a Steven Seagal. <laughs> that's they they have a lot of similarities. They're I mean. not as many differences as you'd expect. Yeah. yeah, not as many as you'd expect. Um, I'm not the best impersonator except <laughs> for this one, which is a spot on Donald Trump. Ah, uh, that was your Cosby. It was it was my Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, the world is just full of rich and powerful sex offenders. Um, speaking of one of them, Steven Seagal. Uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, obviously Seagal slid into obscurity. Uh, he transitioned from big Hollywood star to direct-to-video star. He also put on more and more weight, which isn't at all odd for a man in his late 40s, but did kind of get in the way of his successful action movie career. Sure. Uh, it's worth noting that Steven Seagal currently, look at a picture of him, is the same age, uh, more or less, as uh, Liam Neeson. Uh, oh. who is a believable action movie star. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, he didn't make the right decisions in order to stay relevant, um, although that was probably always a, a, a kind of a long shot, given his mafia finance start. Um, so, uh, and range, I think. Yeah, and Liam range. Liam Neeson can make yeah. seven or eight different kinds of movies. Le- Liam Neeson can act as both Oscar Schindler and yeah. as a guy who punches people in sure. the throat. And yes. the guy from Kroll. And the guy from Kroll. And the guy from Kroll. <laughs> yeah. You put fucking Steven Seagal in Kroll, you ruined Kroll. You would have ruined Kroll, a film <laughs> that could not have been more of a disaster <laughs> if it had had its opening night on September 11th in the World Trade Center. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it was... Strong disagree. I think Kroll is a solid 10 out of 10 film. <laughs> I was not disagreeing with that statement. <laughs> okay. The upshot of Seagal's slide into obscurity is that it gave him a chance to focus more on his spiritual life, <laughs> delivering lectures on Buddhism to classes of the faithful hungry for the wisdom of an ancient lama. And luckily for us, an attendee of one of these classes wrote about it. In the October 1999 issue of GQ, they published an article by David Rakoff titled, Steven Seagal, I Can't Believe It's Not Buddha. Jesus. 1999 was an easier time for jokes. I can't believe the title wasn't Steven Seagal. I can't believe he tried to put his finger in my butt. <laughs> uh, this was a yoga class, though. Well, it was, it was, <laughs> a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a Buddhism class. Sorry. I can't believe it's not Buddha. Yeah, fuck <laughs> you, dude, for writing that. <laughs> fuck it, you. It was 1999. Wait, let's do a fucking episode on that asshole. <laughs> it, was, it was an easier time for comedy. <laughs> yeah, and he still Jerry blew it. Jerry Seinfeld he was the biggest it. name in the world. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld uh, makes lots of great jokes. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, if you brought him this and said, I got this great idea for a joke, I can't believe it's not Buddha, he'd say, get out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> get the fuck out. You're really, we're getting a lot of mileage out of your impressions tonight. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, David Rakoff attended a series of lectures, a Memorial Weekend Day weekend retreat by the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies. The Omega Institute regularly held seminars with luminaries such as Deepak Chopra, but the weekend that uh, Rakoff attended, they scored a real get, Steven Seagal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was teaching a class on quote cultivating compassion and clarity. Oh no! Bef- yeah, this, well, this is the guy you go to. Yeah, you want to cultivate some. Com- you want to cultivate some compassion. You go to the guy who's famous in his movies for torturing people right. and has numerous sexual assault allegations against. I'm really him. great at breaking arms and grabbing titties. Much like the Buddha. Much like Buddha before me, <laughs> and the one living inside me, yeah. and the four I ate. <laughs> uh, so before Seagal arrived, students were advised to address, to address him as Rinpoche, which means literally <laughs> pre- precious jewel. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Rinpoche. <laughs> so 
rack off rights. Precious Jewel eventually does arrive some 45 minutes late. That turns out to be Seagal standard time. He is a large man now, with a bit of a late model Brando girth about him. His narrow eyes, sleek ponytail, and variation on traditional Tibetan attire, an aubergine skirt, and a saffron yellow satin jacket oh lend God. him the air of a Mongol potentate. Fuck this guy. It's article title and then like a fucking four paragraph description of his dress. Oh, it was a beautiful description. Oh, it was a beautiful description. That sucks. He shambles you know in it. slowly, displaying a kind of bewilderment, as if this temporal world were too jarring and suffused with craving and pain for him to absorb just yet. This guy's growing on me. That's a really <laughs> good way to describe the way Steven Seagal moves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it quickly became obvious to the author that the students at the seminar were a mix of serious Buddhists and people who just wanted to hang out with a famous guy all weekend. Sure. Questions quickly turned to Seagal's career. He explains to us that his absence from the screen is but an inevitable consequence of his emergence as a holy man. The <laughs> studios know exactly what they want. Fighting. As I became a llama, I had to establish a line I could not cross, oh. and I've taken two years off as a result. Um, so that's there is not a single Steven Seagal movie where he doesn't beat the shit out of at least ten people. <laughs> no, really meanly too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 gross. Uh, now Rakoff does note that Seagal didn't come across as a dumb guy. He was charming and reasonably good at answering pretty basic questions about Buddhism. His main flaw seemed to be that he was incapable of showing up on time. Uh, quote, the school day consists of a morning session from 9 to noon and an afternoon session from 2.30 to 5.30, but Seagal tends to arrive at least an hour into each, and he stays for only an hour. So, All right. Yeah, Seagal's explanation was the, basically that he was, people can only absorb so much wisdom in a day. That makes sense. That makes sense. He, was, he, was over, he didn't want to overload them on his wisdom. Right. Uh, now, I think it's probably because he's at an all-you-can-eat place. <laughs> like, you know they don't make you leave. So you've been here for seven hours. <laughs> I'll leave when I've had all the crab rangoons I can eat. <laughs> but you have no idea how many crab rangoons I can eat. You don't know what you signed on for. <laughs> so Rakoff notes that Seagal's chief Aikido disciple was brought in to lead stretches for the group. They were originally supposed to be just like 15-minute breaks you know, okay. in the middle of the day, <laughs> but regularly expanded to 45 minutes or longer in order to distract from the fact. Those Aikido stretches. Those, those Aikido are... stretches. <laughs> you got to be limber when you karate chop your hands around for a little bit. <laughs> so he had his guy come in and do stretches while he blew off two-thirds of the classes he had signed up to teach. Even... Like a real Buddhist mystic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, Seagal took the opportunity afforded by his creator and career to indulge in other passions, too, including his passion for being the creepiest possible version of himself. In 2004, he attended the funeral of musical legend Ray Charles. At the funeral, he met Charles's granddaughter, Blair Robinson. Uh, he decided that the death of her grandfather was the perfect place to hit on her uh, via lies. Uh. He invited her to his home to interview for a job as his personal assistant. Now, Seagal didn't do anything creepy at the interview. Uh, probably because her dad, Ray Charles Jr., came to the interview, uh -huh. which is a smart move as a dad if you hear yeah. Steven Seagal wants to interview your kid. Uh, but he did hire her on the spot, and a few weeks later, she was in Memphis with Seagal and his staff. Seagal held a meeting with everybody and then dismissed them all so he could talk to Blair alone, which is another Weinstein uh, yeah. tactic. Yeah. Get At this there, point, Blair. yeah. At this point, the focus of the meeting shifted from the logistics of their current project to the art of Japanese massage. Seagal informed Blair that massaging him would be one of her duties as his assistant, and since he, she didn't actually know how to give massages, Seagal would of course have to teach her. He started to, to demonstrate on her body, but Blair fled the room and flew home to Los Angeles. Good for you. Blair is a smart person. Uh, good on you. Not that, obviously, that other coming. people couldn't escape, and that's not because yeah, they're yeah, not yeah. smart. Not, not saying that. Just credit to Blair for getting the fuck out of there. Good on you. Wish everyone else yeah, had been the, that fortunate. The right combination of assertiveness and yeah. wherewithal. No. Yeah. And that is a that is a dark tale, as all of the allegations of sexual assault and yeah. harassment against Seagal are. And we will be washing a little bit of that out of your tongues uh, in a little bit, because coming up very soon, we're going to be listening to a selection from Steven Seagal's wonderful blues album, Songs from the Crystal Cave, which I bet you didn't know was a blues album if you've listened to any of it, because it sounds, it is as close to the blues as, I don't know, you, you're really more... The that guy. It, it, I'm more what guy? The, 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 the guy who write words things good. <laughs> Do the words. To, you Do want the me to words, describe Sean. Steven Seagal's music in the form of words? Yes. Oh my God, that's really working backwards from an artistic <laughs> perspective. Fuck. 
because because like it, his songs express so much words can't say. Like, like have you ever heard a forty minute fart? <laughs> Put that into words, then try to describe that to someone. If you can't, but Steven Seagal can in song. And that is Songs of the Crystal Cave. We'll be talking about that a li- in a little bit. But first, some songs from ads. <laughs> Dude, the sweet transition. I, I'm really good at transitions. Mm. That's my words. We're back, and we're talking about Steven Seagal. Um, again, we are recording this in a home uh, and, and drinking. A lovely home, and thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's been quite a time. Um, so, uh, next to being a Buddhist lama and sexually, uh, allegedly sexually harassing teenagers, Steven Seagal's music career was his major focus in the early 2000s. Um, so it was in the top three, for sure. Uh, in 2005, he released his first album, Songs from the Crystal Cave. I'd like to read from its top review on Amazon.com <laughs> if I can. Can't wait. <laughs> After a night of hitting the clubs, you meet a girl, head home with her, things get heated, put the CD in you system, oh. turn it on, and you'll find that magic happens. And it also doubles as a great white elephant exchange gift. I can't tell if that one's serious or not. It really, it could go either way. I mean, it, it, it's a funny thing to give as, as a white elephant. Yeah. Like, uh, if you opened a gift and it was a Steven Seagal album, you'd be like, this is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. You, you would. This would be a good white elephant gift. Because yeah. you'd want to have the... Look at the cover. It'll be on our, our website of Steven Seagal's Songs from the Crystal Cave. I can only describe it as it looks like an album that Steven Seagal would write. Like, right. he clearly... He's it, in a loincloth fighting a minotaur <laughs> in the center of an ice maze. No, he's he's what he is now, one hundred percent of the time, which is the stolen valor equivalent of a Native American. Um, <laughs> the, the only Dude, thing he dresses as a, now. That's a solid burn. Yeah, <laughs> stolen valor <laughs> equivalent of Native American. I love it. Steven Seagal, everybody. Uh, my own opinion is more in line with the one star reviews of his album that call it overproduced garbage. Uh, so which, that dude got that fucking Steven Seagal album. He's like genuinely earnestly reviewing it it's it's hard to say it's really hard there it does now i I will say in fairness it has 4.1 stars it is possible that a lot of people enjoyed this album (laughs) okay sure it is i I would say many of the songs on it were you to walk through a store where they were playing you would not notice you would you would just the nicest thing you could yeah it would just it would it would it's boring enough that it would it would pass under your mind like you know it's not as sensational a failure as you'd like hope it's it's not like uh it's not like a Sean or not Sean Connery uh uh Captain Kirk the fuck William Shatner yeah. it's not like William Shatner singing Rocket Man where sure. it's like everyone he, has to hear this but he's like artistically going for it like there's a charm in that level of like yeah enthusiasm total commitment yes and and that I would say is absent from Steven Seagal's uh-huh. music yeah. although you may form a it's different opinion forgettable yeah I would I would call it forgettable. Uh, but 2005 is the year that Steven Seagal started touring with the Steven Seagal Blues Band, uh, which is a creative name for a blues band. Great name. Yeah. In 2006, Big City Blues Magazine put Steven Seagal on their cover. Uh, you can see the picture of it here. He's sitting with a group of blues legends, apparently. I have to trust other people who've written yeah, about not... them that they're blues legends. <laughs> I don't know much about blues. Nothing against blues. It's a wonderful art sure. form. Um... It it does seem from the reviews I've read that the other people in his band are really talented, legitimate blues, blues musicians. And the subtext is that Seagal is paying them all very well because being a great blues musician does not pay the bills. Right. <laughs> yeah. But also, I mean, like, say you're just some blues dude and, like, you've got your own little bubble where you're kind of cool, but, like, Steven Seagal is an internationally known movie star. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. Pro- I think most people would be excited to meet Steven Seagal. Assuming you hadn't listened to the part one of this podcast, you'd be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You made, like, four really good movies and 85 terrible ones. Yeah. I mean, you're, like, a, it's exciting to meet you. You're kind of famous. Yeah, yeah. come take a picture with us. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> tour with you, Steven Seagal. <laughs> right. uh, one of these musicians said in an interview with the Washington Post, quote, I told him he'd have to play these grungy clubs and some real dives where real blues musicians would play. And he said, let's do it. He's focused on making it as a musician. He's paying his dues just like everybody else. Unlike everybody else, however, Seagal traveled to different cities via charter jets and stayed only in luxury hotels. Uh, That's the blues. Which is probably why... That's the blues right there. (laughs) That's the blues. Spending $1,900 a night in a hotel, staying at the fucking W. (laughs) That's the blues. A mini bar's empty. How many... How many great blues albums have been w- written about the Waldorf Astoria? Se- seriously, like countless. 
sometimes the bar closes like at one thirty. <laughs> Well, you're like you, oh. your your flight was late, and you're like I didn't even have time to get my seventh drink. Yeah, that's I got the blues. Heartbreaking, and then you got to go to the mini bar, mm-hmm. and you got to pay way too much for a very small bottle of wine. Yep, yep. The blues, everybody. The blues. We understand it. Yeah. So I get does it. Steven Seagal. <laughs> um, so in that Washington Post interview, Seagal claimed to have been studying the blues since his childhood. Studying the blues. <laughs> yes. What the Quote, fuck does that mean? It means learning about pain, Sean. <laughs> learning about the true pain of an artist, of a blues artist. It implies like he didn't want to, like, oh, I don't want to fucking learn about the stupid blues. Like, head in the books, oh, these fucking blues musicians. <laughs> I only made it through Blues 202. <laughs> right. I never quite got my bachelor's in blues. <laughs> uh, he claims to have learned from the laps of great but unknown, which is really fortunate for him, yeah. Mississippi... Really Delta bluesmen who'd moved north to work in the steel mills. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> yeah, just nine-year-old Steven Seagal and yeah. like a. Well, and also the fact that he's talking about steel mills and he lived in Fullerton, California, <laughs> from the age of five on. Not a lot of steel mills near Fullerton. <laughs> capital of steel mills, capital of blues. <laughs> Fullerton. Well, that's the blues city. It's yeah. not like the anywhere on the East Coast. No, it's <laughs> right. it's it's Fullerton, California, capital of the blues. Now, Sean, I'm not an expert on the blues, as the three <laughs> blues experts listening to this podcast mm-hmm. will surely attest to you. But listening to Steven Seagal's music does not make me think he is a blues musician. I, I would agree, uh, as another non-expert. I'm going to play a selection from the best song on his album, <laughs> Strut. The best. And oh, what do you mean by best? I mean... The best. Okay, okay. I mean, the, we'll leave it ambiguous. I mean, I mean, this song is a work of art. So, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna play a selection from Strut and dance along. You can decide for yourself if Steven Seagal is a real, authentic blues musician. <laughs> All right, here it is. Mr. Steven Seagal, fly down to Jamaica and say, "Man, what is that?" So, does that sound like the blues? Dude, I don't know what the fuck that was. Nobody does. That's the club jam. I know he wants the punani tonight. Now, Is that really what he said? He wants the he punani wants the tonight? Puna- th- that was something like that. And he also says when the girls strut, you want to look at their butts, but you shouldn't do that. Which is advice well, he, he legitimately should have taken. Yeah, like yeah. take your own advice 10 years Steven ago. Steven Seagal and Steven Seagal are songs from the Crystal Cave, oh. which, by the way, the album cover art is is the, the middle bisecting the frame is the, the center of Seagal's guitar with his face on one side and his hand on another and an enormous turquoise ring. On of course pinky. it's a turquoise ring. Is that I, his pinky? You're or goddamn right, it's his pinky. God, it's I should, fucking hot. I should also note, if you look at, he still plays the blues. And if you look at modern pictures from his concerts, Steven Seagal is wearing a kefia in every single one of them. Which, of course. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not, Steven Seagal? You got to get the punani. <laughs> He's going to get that, that... punani tonight. <laughs> Steven Seagal. I everybody. apologize for that particular uh, accent I did. That was my Steven Seagal's reggae blues punani song. The nice thing about making an offensive joke near a Steven Seagal song is that nothing you can say will be worse than that song. All out lands on him because that is a nightmare. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh. It's I like being in the room with with the reggae performers and and not having a question about like. Guys, am I allowed to say this Punani line? Like, this is going to come off as weird? Or You're paying or everyone $40,000 to be here, so <laughs> you say whatever you want. Like, no, Stephen. Yeah. Do you want us to really, like, play up the Jamaican accents? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go real, real Jamaican. Here's a 2014 picture of Seagal play. Oh, my God. Oh, Let me yeah. describe this. He's got just the sweetest orange guitar. He's got a do-rag. His, uh, his shooter glasses, like, he just came from the fucking gun range. Just, like... Like a goatee that looks like it wasn't painted on, but thrown on by like, <laughs> by like a boomerang hunter from 400 yards away and just fucking slapped onto his face. I think he's 
I think that's a yellow scarf, not an ascot. Oh, no, that's a kefia, sir. Oh, ke- that, I'm sorry. That is a, a kefia. Yeah. yeah. That, that is definitely a kefia. It's, I'm being told it's a kefia. <laughs> He's easy 370. Steven Seagal easy has never met a culture he will not appropriate. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's it's a work of art. It's like someone made the <laughs> the first random choice on the creator character, and like that's just fucking what he's stuck with in his regular real life. <laughs> he's like... <laughs> It's a sarcastic creator wrestler in a cutscene, is what the fuck we're looking at. That's a good way to describe Steven Seagal in the modern era. Uh, so now that he's been a blues musician, uh, a Buddhist lama, and reincarnation of a 17th century priest, uh, repeated alleged sexual offender, uh, and of course a, an action star, CIA agent, Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL uh, a great Aikido master as well, obviously. Of after all of that, I bet you're thinking the only thing Steven Seagal hasn't done is be given a position of authority where he's allowed to carry around a gun and has the legal sanction to use violent force. I'd absolutely give that to him. License yeah. to kill all the way. If anyone deserves it, it's this guy. Well, good news! <laughs> In 2007, Steven Seagal revealed that he had been secretly spending the last two decades working as a reserve deputy officer for the Jefferson Paris, Louisiana Sheriff's Department. Yeah. <laughs> I remember this reality show. You remember when he revealed he'd secretly spent yeah. 20 years See, as a cop? Yeah. Yeah. No one knows. I'm Steven Seagal. <laughs> they think I'm a beach ball with, with a napkin on the top of my head. We really caught a lot of beach crime when Steven Seagal joined the force. <laughs> this is so stupid. Because I do remember the premise of that reality show was that he just did this all the time, like unrelated to the, his yeah. other stuff. He was like, yeah, I'm just also a Louisiana sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember on the show he would he would appropriate a lot of black culture. Like if he was meeting like a oh, black family, yeah. he'd be like, "Hey yo, where where the mama at?" And you'd yeah. be like, "What what is this thing you're he doing?" He used the most offensive fake accents yeah. imaginable. He, he also did it as a blues musician. He, yeah. I actually wrote a cracked article about this about Steven Seagal's crime vision. <laughs> and in the show, this happened where he would like stare out the window with his like squinty Steven Seagal eyes, and then it would go all white <laughs> to sort of imply that Steven Seagal had some sort of like fundamental senses that could could tell when crime was near and and so i called that the crime vision and my theory was that that near near him five to six miles away a baby would be turned into a husk and the parents would never know what caused it but it was steven seagal's crime vision because that power has to come from somewhere yeah it has to draw from point. something but even the, the life show, essence of a baby where, makes where sense. they have all of the the editing capacity of a reality show they can create any reality they want <laughs> and that show made it very clear that steven seagal's crime fighting techniques were to drive around until he saw black people and stare at them and if they ran away you found yourself a crime <laughs> that was like fucking every episode <laughs> I don't know if you can still find it, but that's real, and it, I experienced that. Oh, my God, is it ever fucking real. <laughs> and the L.A. Times, God bless them, did some digging into just how true it was that Steven Seagal had spent decades working as a police officer, yeah. which, I mean, I, there are uses I can imagine for him. Like, if you knew a crime was going to occur in a aged leather bag if factory. If you had to plug a hole in a dam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, Steven, stand against this hole in the dam. You got it. <laughs> Crisis Steven, averted. Someone's going to steal a lot of leather jackets. <laughs> Put them all on at once, Steven. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Thank God he's big enough for all the leather jackets. <laughs> Steven Seagal. Okay. Um, so the LA Times did some digging into whether or not Steven Seagal had actually worked for 20 years as a sheriff's deputy uh, and whether or not he had any don't, qualifications. Don't, don't spoil it, but I think he probably didn't. <laughs> it's actually kind of impossible to tell. Uh, the LA Times, yeah, says the LA Times quotes Seagal saying that it started 20 years ago when Seagal was shooting, shooting a movie. Uh, then Sheriff Harry Lee asked him to teach some of his officers martial arts. He was so pleased at what I was doing that he asked me to come onto the force and be one of his cops. Um, maybe. You got good hand to hand combat. You, that's mostly what we do as police. <laughs> that's mostly what we do. <laughs> it's just a lot of karate chopping. You know what the sad thing is? That would be a lot better than the current situation. Yeah. <laughs> if that were the problem, cops keep karate chopping people. <laughs> it's whimsical, but it's another, annoying. Another black youth mildly inconvenienced <laughs> yeah. by police karate chop. <laughs> what a better world that would be. <laughs> I'm saying maybe Steven Seagal should have been the president of police. I don't, I don't yeah. know who heads our police nationwide. You're right. Some sort of doctor? President, mayor, mayor of police. Mayor of police. There we go. 
because the mayor is always on their ass. That makes sense. Yep. That makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Um, so Seagal claims that he worked major cases during this period, although his involvement was officially under the radar for most people. It seems more likely that at most he spent one or two weekends a month or a year okay. uh, doing some volunteer Speaking policing work. Karate to, or Aikido to some cops. Yeah. yeah. When the latter day sheriff was interviewed, he basically said Steven Seagal was grandfathered in, so he had been working with the force for a while, but he seemed frustrated that he couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> this guy fucking keeps showing up. This guy, he, he's here. We were told we can't get rid of him. Um, now, Seagal claims that he attended a police academy in Los Angeles and received a certificate from the Peace Officer Standards and Training Organization. Uh, neither the city of Los Angeles nor Post has any record of Seagal being certified in anything. His rank was described by the LA Times as purely ceremonial, which seems truer than him ever having any kind of training. It seems like it would have come up earlier, right? Like during his Navy SEALs training. Uh, during his Navy SEALs days, yeah, <laughs> when he didn't learn how to read a map. <laughs> All of his lives have like such obvious gaps in the paper trail. Like yeah. if you if you got certified, that implies. A certificate somewhere. Yeah, and the L.A. Times found fucking nothing yeah. uh, from anybody. Why wouldn't he show it to you? Like, yeah, I was a cop. Yeah, uh, not a big deal. But here's the cop certification it, that I don't have. That I don't like. But you can look up on. Oh, you did. Because <laughs> so, you're journalist. Okay. Maybe oh, it wasn't a cop. But you can believe all the other crazy shit I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Seagal insists that his time in law enforcement was purely a public service. Uh, that's why he kept it secret <laughs> until November of 2008 when he decided the- What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> he decided, Sean, in November of 2008, okay. that the, poli- the brave men and women of the Jefferson Paris, Louisiana Sheriff's Department needed recognition. Sure, and why? that's okay. why he launched the reality television series, Steven Seagal, Lawman. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, I know you've seen it. I, I, I'm learning that now, but I'm going to play a little bit of the intro for those of you, those of you in our in our home non studio <laughs> audience, sitting in your car at the gym, fist fighting an ocelot. Here's Steven Seagal, Lawman. I make a living in the movies, but for the past twenty years, I've also been a cop. <laughs> And along with some of the finest deputies on the force, I serve the people of Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. My name is Steven Seagal. That's right, Steven Seagal, Deputy Sheriff. Steven Seagal, lawman, everybody. Some of the finest deputies, like Chubby Racist number one (laughs) and Chubby Racist number three. I forgot to mention Chubby Racist number two. And then, of course, Heavy set racist. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest of them all. Finest man. He's of the a horse. hero. <laughs> we uh we'd like to apologize to a major demographic for this podcast, the Jefferson Paris, Louisiana <laughs> Sheriff's Department. Uh critical listeners, and we really do appreciate y'all. Uh please keep buying the t shirts. Jefferson Paris. Keep getting that Punani. Yeah. <laughs> As Steven Seagal would want you to know. <laughs> Now, I know what you're all thinking, having listened to Steven Seagal Lawman's uh, intro. Is there any way that allowing an alleged serial sexual predator to work as a law enforcement officer <laughs> might go terribly, terribly, terribly wrong? Oh my God, dude. Seriously? Is there any possible? I know it's a long shot, Sean, but is it possible? Can we imagine it? I... Can we conceive of it? <laughs> I'm not in charge of anything, but I'd say... Don't do it. Remember, I, remember when I said we were going to talk about human trafficking? Oh, no. Steven. <laughs> I shouldn't. I, the, the laugh is inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's shocking how yeah. bad of a person he is. And that this, you would, you would think that we had heard the worst of Steven Seagal at this point. God, I'd hope so. <laughs> because he's too old to move right. And, right. and, and it, it keeps on coming. Uh, so according to CBS News, Steven Seagal Lawman uh, had a very successful premiere. Um, you know, it was A&E's most successful premiere in history, actually, wow. at the time. Yeah, it did well. Uh, it was suspended in 2010, though, uh, because Steven Seagal was accused of human trafficking, uh, specifically of keeping a sex slave locked in his John Lafitte mansion, um, which is, you know, maybe he shouldn't have a badge. Agree. <laughs> it seems like it was a bad idea. You guys keeping sex slaves? Cool. Uh... <laughs> Give me a call if anyone steals anything. <laughs> so we're going to get into that, uh, and we're going to get into Steven Seagal's long and storied friendship with dictators. Uh, but first, oh, 
it's time for some ads uh, for some things that are not Steven Seagal Lawman, but I wish they were. <laughs> I apologize to our sponsors. You're far better than Steven Seagal Lawman, as are we all. <laughs> And we're back. Would you say something, Sean? Uh, yeah, I did my uh, basic underwater demolition systems training uh, in uh, Steven Skull's bathtub. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> held our hands out of the water and screamed for a few minutes. And you called it good. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, uh, Jesse Ventura was a Navy SEAL. Yeah. Unlike Steven Seagal. Yeah, and a governor. Mm-hmm. And a governor. And, and a wonderful was actor. Slandered by the mer- mer- sniper, Chris Kyle. For real? Yeah. Yeah. Chris Kyle claimed that he beat him up in a bar because, for whatever reason, he said Jesse Ventura said he hoped that Navy SEALs died in Iraq or someplace. Dude. And I don't like weird anybody's story. chances in a fist fight against Jesse Ventura. Well, there was no fight. It was just a lie. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, Jesse Ventura sued him or, like, sued, eventually sued his wife because, like, he was dead by that point. But, like... Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, the Dude, way that's v- a beef when you go after the dead guy's well, the, wife. The, the, the way Ventura... The way Ventura explains it, he was suing the guy and then he died in the lawsuit. Like, that's just what happens. Ugh. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, don't take that money, Jesse. It does seem like Jesse, the body Ventura, was wrong. Yeah, yeah, I think he won, too. Wrong. I mean, he's dead. Well, and he was lying. Jesse was lying or the No, the no, the, the, the sniper. They never had a fight. Why would you, Jesse Ventura, like, of all the things, he's not going to say he wishes Navy SEALs go die. Like, it would be a strange thing for him to say. It would be a strange thing for him to and say. And it would be super weird to, like, pick a fight with him. The guy's yeah. probably walking around 270. Yeah. And, like, like knows what he's doing. Well, I mean, now he's like an elderly, Jesse, elderly man. Yeah, but if he still gets hold of you, <laughs> and you're just a normal-sized dude, I mean, yeah, I mean, he, tear you in half. He does seem like a dangerous man. Yeah. Although he does go by the mind Ventura now, I think. The, the mind? It, well, because he's, he's, his, his mind is his very sharp. Because his body's faded, but his mind is sharp. He is, like, 70-something. Yeah. I mean, he's in great shape for a 70-year-old, I'm sure. But. I'm going to go by the flopping dong. <laughs> Speaking of flopping dongs. <laughs> yeah, speaking of flopping dongs, eat Doritos. Yeah. No, no. We were talking about Steven Seagal. Yeah. We were talking about Steven Seagal, and we were talking about Steven Seagal, lawman. Um, <laughs> now, well, the, uh, like, like I said, Steven Seagal got accused of keeping uh, a woman as a sex slave in his mansion uh, in rural Louisiana. Don't want to get controversial? Strongly against? Mansions? Keeping a sex slave. Oh, yeah. No. I, uh, this, this show is generally pretty anti-sex slave. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, according to CBS News, Caden Nguyen, uh, 23, saw an ad for an executive assistant job with Seagal's production company on Craigslist. Uh, she answered it, and days later was on his private jet, which, for starts, sounds way better than any Craigslist story goes. Sure, but then it immediately descends into what we're all scared of when we uh. think about Craigslist. Uh, yeah, she was uh, flown to uh, New Orleans, uh, and then they drove to Seagal's house hours away in a rural area with no neighbors close by. It was at this point that Nguyen learned that the job she was expected to perform had nothing to do with being an executive assistant. On Nguyen's first uh, first night, Seagal told her that she would be required to give him massages, which, again, this is all very familiar. This is exactly what he's said to other people. Um, then, according to the suit, he proceeded to treat Miss Nguyen as his sex toy. Nguyen claims that she was sexually assaulted three times in a five-day period by Steven Seagal. She also claims that Seagal kept two young Russian attendants on staff who were available for his sexual needs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm going to read a selection from the lawsuit. Ugh. Once in Mr. Seagal's bedroom, Sasha began massaging Mr. Seagal's back as Miss Nguyen mas- uh, massaged his legs. After approximately 70 minutes, Mr. Seagal abruptly ordered Sasha to leave. As soon as Sasha exited the bedroom and before she could escape, Mr. Seagal began a vicious sexual attack on Miss Nguyen. Uh, Mr. Seagal held her right foot down with his leg and pushed his left knee up with his right hand. Mr. Seagal then forced his hand into Miss Nguyen's vagina. As Miss Nguyen began sobbing, Mr. Seagal became sexually aroused and had a unique physiological reaction to sexual arousal. Miss Nguyen can and will describe in great detail Mr. Seagal's unique physiological reaction to sexual arousal. Other females who have been present when Mr. Seagal has become sexually aroused will be able to verify the truthfulness of Miss Nguyen's factual knowledge about the characteristics gonna, of Mr. Seagal's I'm unique physiological yes. reaction. Squirting diarrhea. <laughs> God, that is the best case scenario. Dude, I am uh, that really is, trying to inject some uh, lightheartedness into this nightmare of a story. Well, you're also saying the best case scenario. Yeah. I, like, I really, I can't even imagine what it would be. As far, I, I haven't heard any sort of confirmation about what it might be. 
Um, Mr. Seagal, or uh, Miss Nguyen cl- claims that Mr. Seagal then ordered her to take some oval-shaped pills before what? she left his room. Um, he told her that he had illegally procured the pills from Tibet. She believed she would, he wouldn't let her leave until she took them, so she took them. Um, she says she was held against her will for almost a full week. When she finally escapes, she claims Seagal chased after her with a flashlight with a gun attached to it, which seems like a scene from one of his movies, but yeah. with him as the bad guy. But, I mean, like... His top speed's got to be like one and a half miles an hour. She got away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She she did get away. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, okay. So now, um, I used to go out with a girl who was on the Burning Man crew with 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 a guy who ran um Kink dot com. And okay. this dude lives in in the the armory. Oh, he lived in the, yeah, 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 yeah yeah that gi- giant. It's a there, gigantic but, castle yeah. in San Francisco that he owned. Yeah, there's people who work there who are like. Straight up sex slaves. Like, that's whatever their fetish is. That's yeah. their job. This is their day job. You don't need to go on Craigslist and say, like, hey, I want an executive assistant. You can just go onto Craigslist and say, I want a sex slave. And theoretically, there's people out there willing to take that job. Theoretically, Steven Seagal could pay someone to do this job. But I, then right. it wouldn't be a power thing. I, I got to think that's so what it is. that's fucking gross about it. Like it's not just that he wants a sex slave. It's like he he literally wants. He, it only works for him if yeah. like that person's trying to escape. Yeah, I, I maybe that's it. I mean, I I'm not of all the things I'm going to try to do on this show. Psychoanalyzing Stephen fucking Seagal it's not a, is not among them. Yeah, don't. Try um. It. So Nguyen claims that she did not call the police at any point because she assumed that they would listen to Seagal. Her lawyer explained, "Mr. Seagal is the police." She is in a remote area of Jefferson Paris. It is Parish. It is in the middle of nowhere, and he is the police, which does seem accurate. I think you would have trouble getting justice. And I mean, look at how hard it is in an ideal court situation for a victim to get justice, and then right. imagine you're in the woods and Steven Seagal is the police. Sure. Yeah. And you're like, not a good racist situation. number four. I'm a, uh, a young Vietnamese woman, and uh, Steven Seagal has uh, sexually assaulted me. Yeah. He's like, wait, Steven Seagal, he taught me how to karate chop through... <laughs> Through 14 pieces of paper. Uh, again, best case scenario. Best. Best case scenario. Best case scenario. If so, they don't shoot her on sight. Yeah, yeah. If she's not eaten by gators in the parking lot of, <laughs> of that sheriff's department. <laughs> Louisiana's really taken a hit today. Uh, Seagal's lawyer obviously called the lawsuit absurd and alleged that Miss Nguyen was an illegal drug user, which you might note does not at all mitigate claims of sexual assault. Uh-huh. Uh, you can definitely use drugs and not be sexually assaulted. I've used so many drugs and never yeah. been a part of any kind of sexual assault. Yeah. Sure. Eh, a lot of my friends would say the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not uh, Steven Seagal. Not Steven Seagal's friends. Uh, now, Nguyen did eventually drop the suit, uh, but only because she settled out of court with Seagal. It seems likely she was paid for her silence, which you can't blame her for. You take the money. Um, but that's also kind of the same story we saw with Weinstein, where there's a lot of NDAs attached to that sort of bribery. Their choice, whatever, man. Yeah. And fuck it. Like, it's hard to get justice. Our president just made fun of the girl for coming yeah. forward. Someone, some rich guy offers you $500,000. like Better than being publicly humiliated. By exactly. Boss. Maybe you do that thing. You can't blame your the choice. victim. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, so... That lawsuit, however, was the end of Seagal's career as a Louisiana peace officer. Uh, so that's that's good, at least. The storied career. <laughs> that, was, that was one bridge too far. Uh, according to Jefferson Parish County Sheriff Newell Normand, Seagal was facing an internal affairs, and affairs investigation immediately following the outcome of his lawsuit. He refused to return to Jefferson Parish, at which time he tendered his resignation. So Seagal fled the state. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Rather than submit to an internal affairs investigation. It was the end of his career as the Louisiana Sheriff's Deputy, but not, however, the end of his career as a dangerously unqualified police officer. I'm sure you're happy about that, Sean. I am happy. It does turn out that after having been accused of sex trafficking while a uniformed deputy, which <laughs> 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 quite the crime. That's like the thing is like they teach you that on day four. And so if like you call in sick oh, on day four, you, they're like you, you don't learn that hey deputies don't take sex slaves because you're starting to get sick on day one, but you really power through those first couple of yep. days. You don't want to miss the start. Yeah, you but learn then firearm day safety. Four, yeah, you learn like conflict which pedal de-escalation. Makes the patrol car yeah. go, which one makes it stop. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. He but you the mix one the one on not sex trafficking. Yeah. Easy it. mistake. Easy mistake to make. Yep. 
Steven Seagal. And you can't catch up. <laughs> like no. The work it comes too fast. No, there's you know, no getting the Cliff's Notes of that the lesson. Louisiana Sheriff's <laughs> Department. <laughs> it's of great. course. It's great, because I don't think he ever had any training. Uh, but the fact that now he's not a real Louisiana sheriff's deputy becomes significant. So, What about the tough streets of Northern California? Well, no. That doesn't count as police training in Louisiana? No, it does not. What, do you got to <laughs> fucking wrestle a gator? What, what do you got to do? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh... I'm not making any sense. I'm, I'm guessing bribe the former sheriff. <laughs> yeah, that would do it. That seems like what happened. Um, so this was not the end of Seagal's career. Uh, as a police officer, as we we already stated. Uh, it turns out that, yeah, after having been accused of all of these crimes, there were still exactly two organizations willing to support Stephen's dream of carrying a gun while feeling important. a and of course. Of course. Great channel, a and uh, And the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> Which, if you were going to guess the Sheriff's Office, I it would be Arizona. Joe fucking Arpaio. Joe fucking Arpaio. Yeah. So, in 2011, Steven Seagal wound up driving a tank into a man's home. <laughs> yeah, well, he was an Arizona sheriff's deputy. <laughs> Dude, I'm not going to lie. That's what I would do if I was the sheriff no, and I had a tank. 100%. Yeah. And, and the veterans listening will yell at me. It's an, it was an armored personnel carrier. I think it was like a Bearcat oh, or something okay. like that. Didn't have like a gun on it. I mean, I think it might have had a gun on it, but didn't have like a turret. You know, okay. it's not not a battle tank. It's meant to carry people. Okay. Yeah. But it was an armored vehicle. It was an armored vehicle with a gun on it. Possibly. Probably. Okay. Probably. Treads uh, or wheels. I'm, I think treads. Okay. Yeah, I, I do That's think a treads. Fucking tank. It's been described don't, as it's usually described semantic. as a tank. That's a tank. All right. All right. All right. All right. Other people are going to yell at me on Twitter, <laughs> and it's your fault, Sean. Um. So Steven Seagal had partnered with Sheriff Joe Apayo's posse to arrest a suspected cockfighting uh, host. Seagal has advocated regularly on behalf of PETA for years and is a strong animal rights activist, Mm -hmm. so it makes sense that he'd consider animal cruelty a crime worthy of having a small army dispatched to stop it. What makes less sense is what happened next. I'm going to quote from an ABC7 article written about the charges the subject of that raid, uh, Jesus Levera, levied against Seagal and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. Quote, Levera denies that cockfighting occurred on his property and says that he raised roosters for show. He says that 100 of them were killed during the raid and that authorities used two armored trucks and a tank to smash through a gate into his yard and that at least 30 SWAT personnel dressed in riot gear and armed with handguns or rifles rushed his home. Lavera said he was unarmed. Lavera said Seagal distracted his chickens by deploying explosives and then commandeered a sheriff's office tank and crashed through an iron gate on his property. So... Uh, Levera also alleges that his puppy was shot dead during this. Jesus Christ. So 100 chickens and a puppy. Uh, Seagal denies killing any animals. Minus the puppy? No bullshit. That's exactly what I'd do if you gave me a (laughs) tank and a badge. No. I would fucking drive straight on to some dude named Jesus' property, (laughs) kill all his fucking chickens. It's show roosters? Fuck you, Jesus. (laughs) And this is, again, why cops shouldn't have tanks. (laughs) I yeah. bear I barely agree the army should have tanks. I have known a couple of tankers. <laughs> None no. of them have been people I trust with tanks. <laughs> Maybe no one should be trusted with tanks. I think my whole point is I know enough about myself to self-select away from a job that would give me a tank. Yeah, yeah. Steven Seagal Put himself right Put there. Himself right killed a hundred chickens and maybe a puppy. Yeah. Allegedly, he denies it. See, I, I grew up on a farm and I, uh, I've met some chickens, so I, I I don't give a shit. Some chickens. The chickens are miserable. Yeah, garbage the, monsters. I lived with some chickens up in my last place in Arcata, and they were always shitting on the floor. Oh, they're they, the worst. Yeah, they're terrible animals. They have. Uh, we used to have a, um, a water supply for chickens. It's sort of like an upside down bucket with a trough, mm-hmm. so it would sort of percolate into the trough, and the chickens would shit in it in a way that like didn't make any sense. It implied they either like slowly back their ass into their own water supply or they were leaping over it and like acrobatically shitting with perfect timing. And so at a certain point, you're just like, why go through so much trouble to shit in your own water supply unless you're just a garbage monster that shouldn't exist? So that's how I feel about chickens. So when I hear about cockfighting, I'm like, all right, well, whatever. It's what they were going to do anyway. Speaking of which. I watched, uh, if I could still keep talking about chickens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my mother was attacked by uh, a chicken once. <laughs> uh, we had two roosters, and when you have two roosters, they kind of go crazy. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, the other thing, uh, much like Stevens called chickens are hardcore rapists. No <laughs> chicken has ever willingly given herself to the lovemaking process of a bird. 
So she'll be just walking along like, ooh, what's this in the ground? What's this in the ground? And the rooster will come up and like, <laughs> and like she'll freak the fuck out for four seconds and then the rooster will leave and he'll do that to her every single day. Chickens have a terrible life and they all should be killed. But the point is, if you have two roosters, they go crazy. So my, my mom goes out to collect some eggs. And one of these roosters, driven mad by a dick competition, leaps at her face. And she comes in and she's like, oh my God, the rooster tried to kill me. And my stepdad gets all fucking aggro. He's like, nobody fucking tries to kill my wife. And so he takes a, he takes a sidearm out to the chicken coop. And I'm just a young child, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, what? Are you going shooting? That's weird. He usually takes me. And he fucking gets, like, his feet shoulder with the part, like, execution style. He's so fucking pissed at this rooster. And he explodes a chicken just 20 feet from me, unprepared. And I'm like, what? What is going on with this entire world? And and I'm just saying, like, this is an ordinary day in the life of a chicken farmer. No, and chickens, I will also say in Jesus's, you know, defense or whatever, 100 chickens is not a weird number of chickens to have if you have chickens. Right. They're addictive. But if, but if the this people dude who had chickens. more than one rooster, chances are he was making them fight. And it says 100 Ooh. chickens. Now, I don't know. Right. I don't know if the ABC7 reporters mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. that much background work. I'm saying, hey, Zeus, uh, let's do a background on that fella. Well, I, I'm going to guess Maybe they Steven did. Seagal was right to drive a tank on his property and just go <laughs> fucking crazy. And shoot his puppy dog. <laughs> okay, that part is like, dude, what In the front of his kids. Steven Seagal. Well, dude, I, I was actually was a little Seagal bit wrecked. When I watched animal. that chicken explode, I was a little bit wrecked. If that was a dog I saw <laughs> oh, yeah, shot, kill dude, you. I'd be fucking... That would have been the 10th time today I told that story, because that <laughs> would have been all I think about. Yeah. No, it, Those but, kids are haunted by darkness. There's some fucking Dexter kids. Jesus. Yeah. Seen a puppy guy get shot yeah. by some cops or Steven Seagal, unclear which. Yeah. Steven Seagal denies all allegations, uh, clearly. So, yeah, it's hard to say exactly what happened. Uh, Jesus adds that when he was removed from the building, uh, he was immediately asked to sign a release uh, by the <laughs> producers of the show. <laughs> We're going to use your chicken house on TV. Can we use this on TV? He did not sign the release. <laughs> Good for him. This has not aired on television. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> it would be awesome if they aired it, but like blurred his face, blurred the chicken faces. <laughs> They're being fucking trampled by SWAT Blurred team. all but one of the chicken faces. <laughs> he signed the release. There was one chicken that wanted yeah. it. <laughs> he wants to be a star. He's trying to get a spot in real world Louisiana. Uh, so Levera's cockfighting charge was quickly dismissed, probably because it seems like the police broke many laws. <laughs> In Dude, all of this? Are you telling me there's a fucking law against driving a tank on a 70s house with like no probable cause? The Quartering Act. The qu Weirdly enough, it's a little corollary in there. But it's up in there. No no British soldiers in your home, no tanks through no your gate. No tanks through your chicken coop. Nope. Nope. Not allowed. Not allowed. Uh Levero was charged with possession of steroids, uh, which I'm gonna guess is probably not what they deployed 30 SWAT officers and several armored vehicles yeah. to find. Was he ripped or did he have like some back pain or something? I think it might have been steroids for the animals, to be honest. Oh, uh, okay. It's not uncommon, you know. Sure, they found it in like a small fridge near the chickens or something like that. Yes. Who knows? Delicious um, chicken breasts all pumped up. Well, you're not going to have good That would imply that he's, he's like raising them for food and not to fight each other. Th this this would further exonerate right. him if, if they're bird <laughs> yeah, steroids, they illegal steroids, bird steroids. If they found steroids, it, he's exonerated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, boy. Um, Unless, I guess, do you give steroids to fighting cocks? I have never hosted cockfights. Uh, I was in a fight with a turkey once. <laughs> How'd you do? Oh, it was a gentleman's fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we both won the gentleman. Oh. Yeah. Your, your differences were settled? Well, differences were settled. Okay, we came to an accord. <laughs> Good time. Um, so, yeah, uh, the raid was never aired. Uh, here's a picture of Steven Seagal in a fake uniform next to Joe Arpaio, also wearing a fake uniform. He's in, like, Marine Digicam, and Joe Arpaio oh, is in the sheriff's office, but he has four stars on his shoulders as if he's George fucking yeah, Patton. He's, he's a fucking <laughs> four-star general of the sheriff's department. <laughs> what is it about the worst Dude, people in history in fake awards? show. It's a goddamn Halloween costume. Yeah, it's it's shockingly bad. It's like two guys that got kicked out of a house party on Halloween for like fucking Yeah. One of the things that's funny about this valor. I was in Ukraine for their first Independence Day after the uh, the Maidan revolution. So this is while it was kind of like the civil war is really just starting to heat up. And they had just opened up their military to like volunteers. So like essentially it seemed like 
from what I could gather, if you put on a uniform, you were basically in the army. <laughs> right, and they you. had, and we did, as clo- the closer we got to the front line, there were a lot of just like middle-aged dudes who had a Kalashnikov and threw on a thing. But they were like, when we were in Kiev, far away from the fighting, it just every man was in a uniform. And there were a lot of very heavy set older men clearly trying to pick someone up by pretending they were going to yeah. go fight in the Civil War. And like, you just That's bought a, a uniform. Move. That's a good move. <laughs> That's how Steven Seagal looks in this picture. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm off to fight war. Yeah. He's sexy. <laughs> Although the actual Steven Seagal would never have sided with the Ukrainians against the Russian occupiers. Uh, I, I do know enough about Steven Seagal to know he's a very big fan of Russia. <laughs> very big fan yeah. of Russia. Uh, very against uh, the sovereignty of people yeah, yeah, yeah. who decide their own. Navajna, yeah. Navajna. <laughs> uh, the case uh, against Levera was eventually overturned, or the case that Levera filed against Seagal and the Sheriff Department was eventually dismissed by a judge after Levera fired his lawyer and failed to show up in court to pursue matters further. There was a controversy in Arizona over all of this because even though the opening to Stephen Seagal lawman said, said Stephen was on loan from Jackson Parish, he had actually resigned and was therefore in, in no- shame. Yeah, in shame for sex trafficking <laughs> and was no longer a lawman, which means Arpaio was not using a lone Louisiana sheriff's deputy, but was just letting a random yeah. civilian dress like a soldier a and leave raids. A fugitive sex criminal. Yeah, a, a, a fugitive <laughs> sex criminal who had run from an internal affairs investigation, drive a tank, wearing a uniform, and armed with a gun. <laughs> Joe his, Arpaio. It's his kind of guy. Joe Arpaio will for sure be an episode of this show. Um, <laughs> Steven Seagal, lawman, only a- lasted three seasons. But don't you dare, don't you fucking dare, Sean, feel sorry for Steven Seagal. Oh, I wouldn't. He has, it. <laughs> he has other priorities than his television career. Priorities like his friendships with several of the world's most prominent dictators and strawmen. Oh, sweet. And he's got that widow's peak that like touches the bridge of his nose. It's very unusual. Very unusual. Most men... Don't most, it goes that. the other direction for yeah, most men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was not Steven Seagal. Uh, so let's start with Viktor Lukashenko, uh, the so-called last dictator in Europe and the leader of Belarus. Lukashenko is known for torturing and disappearing political rivals and letting his small child walk around with a golden handgun. Uh, he and Seagal met up back in 2016, and um, it's, it's, it's special. The dictator called him his dear friend, and Seagal claimed to have Belarusian ancestry. Which he he's he's claimed that about numerous nations around yeah. the world. Uh, he's quite a mix. He's quite a mix. The <laughs> classic Mongol Belarusian. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, they stopped by to pick some pet fresh carrots, and then this happened. Sean, I oh, are you show me the carrot picture. I you I, think I oh, haven't seen the carrot oh, picture? I'm not going to show you the carrot picture. <laughs> I am going to show you Steven Seagal eating a goddamn the parrot whole, carrot with a dictator Sarah. in the. Oh, there he is. All right, here's this. So they're 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 at a, a farm picking carrots, and uh, Lukashenko, the dictator who had his last political rival for president imprisoned and tortured, uh, is is shaving up a carrot and about to hand it to Stephen. <laughs> He's going to town on that carrot. Really thinking about it. <laughs> you uh, yeah, you, you owe it to yourself. To, to watch Steven Seagal eat a, pe- eat a carrot, because he eats it exactly the way people don't eat carrots or anything. Contemplatively. Yeah, contemplatively. <laughs> eats a carrot handed to him by a dictator, while uh, the dictator's son, who is 100% carrying a very heavy golden handgun in that video, because he always is. Why not? Always is. Uh, is, is it tells him it's healthy. I um, gave my daughter nunchucks, which I think is like a little cooler than a golden gun. I mean, I don't want to brag or nothing. Nikolai like, Lukashenko wouldn't agree. <laughs> Nikolai yeah, how many times has your daughter met Hugo, Hugo Chavez? How many times? Uh, she met that Jesus guy that had all those dead chickens. <laughs> <laughs> you were just doing the Steven Seagal lawman <laughs> tour of the Southwest. Right, yeah, yeah. 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 Like that's, I do all that of, every year. Visit, visit the site of all I his take massacres. the family to the site of Steven Seagal's greatest crimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long vacation. Oh, my God. It's about to get longer. Um, <laughs> according to the Moscow Times, he was later handed a watermelon by Lukashenko's son, but was not required to eat it on the spot. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Belarusian law says you may wait up to seven hours before eating watermelon. <laughs> Apologies to our Belarusian listeners. Uh, Why would you apologize? It's no, because there, there's Belarusian no way this media accent. is allowed there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they have a dictator. I'm so sorry for your plight. Uh, solidarity, my friends. 
Um, so this gets into something that I think drives some people crazy, which is the weird ways in which all of the world's shittiest and most dangerous people are connected. Right. Like so far, we've we've done one episode that featured partly on Lukashenko. We've done one on Alex Jones. We're definitely going to cover Joe Arpaio. He's already friends with all of these people, mm-hmm. and we're not even through fucking Steven Seagal's dictator buddies. It's weird that terrible people have friends. I think this is like the root of a lot of conspiracy theories. But I think it's kind of sensible if you just assume that shitty people like to hang out with other shitty people. Yeah. <laughs> like, who else is going to hang out with you know? Steven Seagal but garbage? <laughs> right. Like, if you're talking about, like, your your date, and you're like, how'd the date go? You're like, oh, this guy, I don't know if we have a lot in common. And then Steven Seagal's like, she tried to get away, but I already had my hands on her wrist, and she, I tore her arm off. And they're like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I think you or I might say, Steven, that's a terrible yeah. story. Steven, that's horrible and also certainly did not happen. Yeah, definitely didn't happen. You're a liar. You are sweating just standing yeah. up to get the check. <laughs> <laughs> Steven Seagal. Uh, Fuck so, you, Steven Seagal. Yeah. While we're on the subject. <laughs> this has been the subject of the whole podcast. So uh, it may not surprise you to know that Steven Seagal is also friends with Rodrigo Duterte. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, the president of the Philippines, who has had 20,000 people and counting murdered by motorcycle-bound death squads. During one meeting... To uh, be fair, he said only kill the drug users, right? Well, but you're going to shoot people, you're going to hit other people. Yeah. Yeah. Steven I, Seagal understands. The cost of murdering... Drug users. Wasn't one of his movies collateral damage? It should have been. Yeah, was, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger might have done a collateral <laughs> damage. I mean, but, that uh, was an actual Tom Cruise movie, right? Collateral with Jimmy Fox? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With a taxi cab, something but like collateral that. Collateral damage was Schwarzenegger. Oh. And that, that, that New Zealand guy, the Maori guy that always plays Middle Eastern people. I, I don't remember I. the actor's name. I can tell you that Steven Seagal is a great friend to Rodrigo Duterte. Uh, during their meeting, uh, Seagal told the almost dictator that he'd visited the country more than 100 times, although he did not specify why. <laughs> 100 times? I'm going to guess creepy, gross Steven Seagal sex. Yeah. Yeah, that's 100% what I'm going to guess, because he's Steven Seagal. Or maybe zero times and he's just fucking lying. Maybe he's just a gigantic liar, because he's lied about every single other thing Maybe he story. mistook it for Hawaii. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Hundred times, yeah. Um, so Steven Seagal's most lasting and most consequential friendship uh, is with one of the most powerful and dangerous men on the planet, Vladimir Putin. Uh, the how behind this friendship started with a guy named Bob Van Runkle. Uh, Mr. Van Runkle lived in Moscow until recently and ran the company Doors to Hollywood, which specialized in taking famous people over to Russia. While Van Runkle denies any political motivation to his work, it really does seem like his job was basically to make famous people sympathetic to a number of Russian and Eastern oligarchic power brokers in order to push a very specific and particular political agenda. Uh, in which country? Like, like oh, what? in the United States in... towards Russia. Okay. He's basically bringing celebrities over to the East in okay. order to make them like Russia and like Ukrainian I see. oligarchs, and then they'll talk nice about it. Okay. No, that seemed to be kind of his goal, you know? He, he's been at parties with Trump and stuff, too. Sure. Like, there's, some, there's some weird connections there. I just found out about this guy. Otherwise, I would have done a deeper dive into Van Runkle, but he is the guy who apparently introduced Vladimir Putin and uh, Steven Seagal. Uh, he Match also, weirdly enough, he introduced Oleg Deripaska, who is um, he's in a Ukrainian aluminum tycoon who was Paul Manafort's entry into that part of the world. Uh-huh. He introduced Deripaska to Jim Carrey for reasons that are unclear to me so uh-huh. far. Uh, I'll be... Looking into that, but <laughs> I don't like the sound of that. I don't like the sound of that at all. <laughs> I don't like the sound of Jim Carrey. Meet- Jim Carrey doesn't need to be meeting any o- Ukrainian oligarchs. Jim Carrey seems like if you had him alone in a room, uh, he might believe everything you said. For yeah, you know, he doesn't seem like a guy who's who thinks w- when he hears something, he doesn't think maybe that's not true. Yeah, that he seems like a nice guy. Sure, but does not seem like he has seems... a great deal of credibility. Right. Yeah, in terms I, of his ability to I'm question it's a story, possible to influence. A yes. Jim Carrey. Yes. Uh, very curious about that meeting. Yeah. Yeah, very curious about that meeting. Uh, in 2010, Van Runkel brought Steven Seagal to Russia. Quote, I was hired to bring Steven Seagal to perform with his band for another event with President Putin. So, was kind of responsible for that introduction and Steven becoming best friends with him. So, that's nice. That's, that's what Beautiful Van Runkel said to NPR. Um, I really hope Putin enjoyed uh, Steven Seagal's blues band. I bet he didn't. <laughs> He seems I like do. a man who doesn't have a ton of joy in his life, but also Steven Seagal's band fucking sucks. <laughs> I will Except say, for that Punani song. It's pretty hot. I will say, one of the nice things about this whole tragic story is imagining these like 
these like old sad blues singers getting a free trip to Russia. Yeah. Like fuck it, at least you know you, they probably had rough lives. Yeah, they're not they're not Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> free trip to good, Russia. Good luck, guys. Yeah, I hope it, I, Vladimir Putin. I hope you stay in. We gave Vladimir Putin the blues. <laughs> yeah. Well, we 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 sang about Punani. <laughs> right. <laughs> there was no blues. Song. We put on some Jamaican accent. Yeah. About Punani. It was a shameful time for all, but we <laughs> stayed in a nice hotel. I hope that that fueled some good blues albums, like the sorrow of being of having to work with Steven Seagal in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Just that it would seem like it might. I think so. The playing with Seagal blues. Yeah. Everyone can relate. Everyone's <laughs> been in a band headed by a lying rapist Aikido master movie I mean, star. That is a tale as old as time. Ugh. So, uh, at an after party for the event where Seagal's band played for the president, uh, the actor met Putin personally. The two kept up a friendship for years and bonded over their mutual love of martial arts, uh, which, I mean, obviously, in a fight between the two. There's, there's not even a question. Vladimir Putin's going to tear him apart. I, <laughs> I definitely have Vladimir Putin in that fight. He's, he seems like a dangerous man yeah. in a number of ways. Uh, not to overstate I think his capabilities. he's either got a knife. Yeah, but I also know that he at least dabbles in judo, which beats Aikido any day. Well, and it's also like he just doesn't seem like the kind of guy to hesitate to hurt somebody, right? Which is kind of the key when you're trying to hurt somebody. And I think Steven Seagal could get cowed by just like a harsh word. Yeah, yeah, or a couple of mafia people. Right, <laughs> he's the only one in the room with a gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, in 2016, Putin gave Seagal a Russian passport and Russian citizenship, which is the kind of thing you could do when you aren't accountable to the laws of your own nation. <laughs> it's a sweet gig being a dictator. Uh, according to the Washington Post, Seagal once referred to Putin as one of the greatest world leaders, if not the greatest world leader alive today. His geopolitical bromance with Putin is only part of the attraction to the country, Van Runkel estimated. His career peaked there, but he's not doing the 30 to $60 million movies he once was. Russia is a place to rebrand himself. And apparently, Seagal decided to rebrand himself as an international diplomat to dictators. Well, and, yeah, well, I mean, natural, natural elevation. Uh, in 2013, Russia's deputy prime minister, Dmitry Rogozin, uh, suggested to President Obama that Steven Seagal be given a special diplomatic status to help bridge the hostile gap that had developed between the two nations. President Obama declined because he was <laughs> an actual person who knows things. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this story doesn't go off in a President Obama direction. <laughs> oh, oh, if only, if only. Um, Putin did find a way around Obama. Since Seagal was already a Russian citizen in 2018, Putin just had him appointed a special diplomatic envoy for Russia. This means that Steven Seagal, alleged sexual harasser and serial rapist, uh, alleged serial rapist, is now in charge of improving Russo-American relations. <laughs> He's doing a great job so far. There is so much more to say about oh. Steven Seagal, and we're there time. We could continue talking about Seagal for hours. He is a truly remarkable piece of shit. But I, I'm afraid we have to draw the line at some point, and this is where I fixed it. I do want to tell one little story Yeah. about Judo Jean LaBelle. Uh, tell me a little about Judo Jean LaBelle, because I understand this guy is a yeah, yeah, no, he's a like a uh, he's a legit judo guy. He uh you know, he was the uh trained Ronda Rousey back mm. in the day. And he did some like MMA before that was like a thing. Like he had some real fights against boxers where he would like, you know, take them down and, and choke them out. And um I, I, I assume the story you're telling about him and Steven Seagal was Steven Seagal um talking to Gene LaBelle and how he's like, I could get out of any choke hold. And Judo Jean's like, well, whatever, pal. And he's like, no, 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 I'm serious. Put me in a chokehold. And so he talked him into like putting him in a real chokehold. He said he had a special move that could get him move. out of any chokehold. Right. Yeah. And here's what that fucking special move was. It was a karate chop to the dick. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> that's the fucking make-believe world Steven Seagal was living in, that he thought his he knew a secret to get out of a choke, and it was like the first move that fucking man invented when they started fighting. <laughs> it was like, a hit to the he dick. He thought he invented the punch to the dick. So Gene LaBelle chokes out Steven Seagal, and Seagal allegedly craps his pants. Yes. And allegedly. Seagal has denied this. Cool. Why? You're not going to fucking admit to that if you're a liar. <laughs> no, you're not. And LaBelle was even the classiest you could be about yeah. saying another man. He was like, well, you know, it's not uncommon when a guy gets choked out after having a big meal. It might happen. Yeah. He wasn't mean about it. Sure. I think Steven Seagal shed his pants. I think it's, we got a 90% chance of, of Steven Seagal shitting his pants. So, before we roll out here, Sean, mm. I, I, 
when I started to research for this, I, I Googled the name Steven Seagal. Just yeah. typed it in and see what would turn up. You know, usually a fun place to start research. On the right-hand side of the search results page, I was presented with three quotes from the actor in Luminary. I'd like to read those quotes now. Please. Quote number one. I am hoping that I can be known as a great writer and actor someday rather than as a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he did write Good luck. He did write a book recently, The Way of the Shadow Wolves, with Dude. someone else. We will we'll we'll that has to be another. There was just too much. There's, you're right. I couldn't cover it. it. It's about how Obama tried to conquer the country. It's really like all of the Fox News talking points yeah. like filtered through Alex Jones's craziness into the mind of a very very dumb man who doesn't care about the truth. Weird that he went hard right because you would have guessed he would have been like a loony left kind of guy. You would think. Yeah, what with like the Buddhism and the spirituality yeah. stuff, but nope. He's all in on Trump. Interesting. Interesting how that happened. Uh, second quote. I have made a lot of mistakes, but I've worked hard. I have no fear of death. More important, I don't fear life. <laughs> Fuck you. There's Steven a lot of Seagal. wisdom in that statement from Steven Seagal. <laughs> he wishes. All right, that, dude, that's the most fucking I'm trying to sound fucking wise bullshit. <laughs> I didn't even include this stuff, but like, what one a of dumb the, person trying to sound smart. One of the through lines in this is his repeated attempts to get writing credits on movies he didn't write and being denied them by like the writers, <laughs> the WGA being like, no, you didn't write this, you don't get a writing credit. I had on the it. idea that I should have all the funny lines too. <laughs> what? I don't get a writing credit for that. He also said he'd rather be doing movies like Sense and Sensibility than Under Siege, something like that. Like that he he wished he wanted to pull people's heartstrings. Good luck to you, buddy. He didn't. Uh, <laughs> he never did. Not even he didn't even try one. <laughs> no. He had the pull. He could have fucking made it. Ne- never attempted. Jean Claude Van Damme did Nowhere to Run. That was sort of a. And he did JCVD, which sure. had some had some emotional beats. Yeah, had some emotional beats. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna one one more quote. It doesn't work if the bad guys kill his mother's uncle's friend's neighbor's pet dog. You've got to make the stakes high. Which I think is fun because he almost certainly killed a guy's dog. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that guy fucking killed 70 of a guy's chickens in one fucking minute. <laughs> oh, boy. Steven Seagal. That's all I have on Steven Seagal. Uh, I it, think that's plenty. That was more than enough. Yeah. Uh, real piece of shit. Sean, do you want to plug your pluggables before we roll out sure. here? Uh, uh, you can find me on crack.com. You can find me on Twitter. You can play uh, Attack Lords on mobile devices. You know, that's it. I'm around. I'm easy. easy to find. You can find me on Twitter at IWriteOkay. You can find me on, uh, uh, or you can find our website, BehindTheBastards.com, where there will be some very, very sad pictures of Steven Seagal. Um, really profoundly depressing. Uh, as well as all the sources for this article. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at uh, BastardPod. And, uh, yeah, that's it. This is the end of the episode. I cannot imagine talking more about Steven Seagal. Done. So we're done. We might, rot- we might watch it. Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah.